I'm um, one of the lead researchers on our upcoming trial looking at psilocybin for anorexia. So I'll be talking a little bit about that trial uh, at the end. So let's start with what we know. And I don't need to go into a lot of detail about this with this audience, but as we're all aware, there's been growing interest um, over the last few years in psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, so this image is a Google search um, trends image for the search for the term psychedelic therapy. And as you can see, it's kind of been steadily increasing uh, across the past 10 years. Um, and this is largely coming off the back of a number of very successful clinical trials, which have not only shown safety and tolerability, but also potential efficacy across a number of um, psychiatric conditions. Um, so as I was saying, lots of different mental health conditions, psychiatric conditions, and we're talking about, you know, in, in most cases, we're talking about psilocybin here. So we're talking about um, one drug, um, or one medicine, and how can it be effective across the board? And this sort of raises the idea of, is there a common underlying factor that underlies all of these different mental health conditions? Um, and I would argue that in a lot of cases, what we're seeing is really the tip of the iceberg. So in a lot of cases, the symptoms that sort of characterize a condition um, are really only what we see, but what's going on underneath the surface might be what's connecting all of these conditions together. Um, and this is where the Rebus model comes in. So if anybody's been following uh, the work of, of Robin Car Harris, my boss, and, and, and Carl Friston, you would have come across this already. Um, but I'm just going to give a brief overview of, of the Rebus model. So this is built on the idea that our brain works as a predictive machine. So it predicts what we're going to see, experience in the world around us, and it builds models of this in our brain. So things that we know occur in the environment, so things like the sky is blue and gravity goes down, all of these things that we know, we don't have to code that on a minute by minute basis, because your brain already has a model of that. All you have to code is what's different from what you expect. And these sorts of codes, these models are held in our priors or our prior expectations about the world. And they're kind of developed by sort of higher levels of the cortical hierarchy, and then they trickle down the cortical hierarchy and affect processing at every stage. And what that means is that when you get incoming sensory information, the processing of that information is shaped by our prior expectations at every level. Um, now, this can be really helpful, it's really efficient for us to process in this way, but it can also lead to problems if our expectations um, might be uh, sort of maladaptive, which might be the case in a lot of mental health conditions. Now, what this model proposes is that psychedelics work at the level of these priors, that they reduce the uh, sort of the prior or the weighting of these priors so that your brain is more able to kind of experience things in a new way. Your experiences are less um, sort of rigid, less defined by what you expect. And it kind of opens up your brain to, uh, to a, new, a new way of experiencing. And there's lots of neuroimaging data supporting this at the moment. You know, a number, like loads of, of new um, neuroimaging studies coming out every day. Um, well, not every day, but all the time. Um, but what hasn't really been looked at much yet is the psychological correlates of these um, neuroimaging studies. So what actually occurs on a psychological level? Um, and can we measure the rebus and this relaxed, um, these relaxed priors, these relaxed beliefs um, on, a, on a psychological level? And that's why me and some colleagues at Imperial developed the relaxed beliefs questionnaire. Um, so this questionnaire uh, asks participants to identify four beliefs, um, one, uh, two beliefs that they have about themselves, a positive one and a negative one, and two beliefs that they have about others, a positive one and a negative one. So we ask people to identify their own beliefs rather than giving them a belief because we really want to get at the core of what they believe about themselves and their environment. So we ask people sort of you know, what is one belief that you hold about yourself that's positive? And we really work with them to kind of get at, at what's kind of underlying, uh, what's at the core of that. Um, and then once we've got people to identify these four beliefs, we can ask them how certain are you that this belief is true from zero, not certain at all, to 100, absolutely certain. And we can ask them that question time and time again. 
Um, so we used this uh, measure in our study uh, looking at um, healthy individuals, healthy psychedelic naive individuals, um, where um, individuals in this trial had two psilocybin dosing days. The first was a low dose day, one milligram, and the second was a high dose day, 25 milligrams. So all participants were given both of these doses um, and they were separated by a month. Um, and we used this rebus measure to, or this relaxed beliefs questionnaire rather, to look at changes in their beliefs um, uh, in these low dose and high dose conditions. So they were given, uh, we, were, we asked them to identify their beliefs at baseline. They then had a low dose acute experience where we used the measure acutely. They then had a four week break. Um, we did a follow up to see if their beliefs had changed sort of a month later. Um, they then had a high dose experience and again, uh, one month follow up. Um, so there is much more to come out of the study. This is just one, one little small part of a much larger study. Uh, so uh, watch the space for, for more publications coming out from this soon. Um, but um, this is just an overview of the results that we got from this relaxed beliefs questionnaire. So first let's look at the low dose situation. So we had pre, acute and post um, where people rated their confidence in the beliefs that they'd identified about themselves. And basically there's no change. So people's confidence in their beliefs doesn't change from a one milligram um, a dosing session um, with psilocybin. This is the high dose condition. So um, this is pre, acute and post. And what you can see here is that in the acute phase, when we asked people how certain they were, were about their beliefs, their confidence dropped. So they were sort of less sure about the things that they previously identified, the beliefs about themselves in the world that they previously identified. But what I think is really interesting is this last column here. So this is one month later. So the red line there is uh, self negative beliefs. Um, the blue and the yellow are um, positive self and negative other. And the purple one at the top is positive other, which remains pretty high the whole way through. So I kind of like that. Um, but um, what's really important is that the self positive and other negative beliefs kind of stabilize after a month, whereas the negative self-belief continues to go down. So not only do we see a decrease in confidence and self-beliefs in the acute phase, but we see a, a revision of beliefs in the long term. Now, for different belief categories, that revision um, leads to different things, but What's really interesting is the, it's the negative self-belief that cont continues to decrease in confidence. So what this does is it really supports this idea that, um, uh, that, the psych that psychedelic psychotherapy works through um, changing um, our sort of confidence in negative self-beliefs. Um, and importantly as well, this change in confidence in the negative self-beliefs correlated really nicely with changes in well-being. Um, in that one month period. Um, so this um, provides the first sort of uh, psychological demonstration of uh, this sort of idea of relaxed beliefs in the psychedelic state. Um, but it also, what it also highlights is that there's this sort of post-acute revision and more work needs to be done to explore kind of what determines um, which beliefs uh, might continue to change in confidence and which beliefs don't. Um, but this is really exciting. Um, and there's lots more to come in the space. Um, but I'm going to change tack a little bit now. Um, that was about what we know. I'm now going to talk a little bit about where we're going. And this is the work that um, I'm really focused on now, which is our upcoming clinical trial looking at psilocybin assisted therapy for anorexia nervosa. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know much about anorexia, um, it is a um, eating disorder uh, characterized by a restriction of energy intake um, leading to lower body weight, um, an intense fear of gaining weight and disturbances in the experience of one's own body weight and shape. Um, so it is one of the most fatal of all psychiatric conditions. Ben's right, it's not the most common, um, but it is becoming more common, particularly during COVID times. There have been massive increases in the number of individuals who are being diagnosed with eating disorders. And while it does primarily, anorexia does primarily affect um, young women, um, there are increasing numbers of children, males and older adults being diagnosed with the condition. 
Um, and here I've presented the sort of DSM criteria, so the symptomology of anorexia. But again, I'll remind us that these are just symptoms and perhaps there's something underneath that we might be uh, better focused on. So what do we know about psychedelics and eating disorders? Uh, not very much at the moment. Uh, there have been a few studies. So the first, um, the first sort of evidence that we've got for the efficacy of psilocybin in treating anorexia actually came from a case study in 1959 in Paris um, of a young woman who was treated with two intravenous doses of psilocybin. Um, and that quote from the top there is taken from her. So I feel as though the weight of my, of my flesh is free, my body, my old bonds without effort, they have been been lifted. And it was concluded in this patient that psilocybin had an indisputable therapeutic action. Below that, we've got a quote from uh, a couple of studies that were um, run by Adele LaFrance and colleagues looking at uh, ayahuasca. So they spoke to individuals who'd been to ayahuasca retreats to help them in recovery from an eating disorder. And not only did they find decreases in eating disorder symptomology after their ayahuasca experience, but they also found reports of increased self-love, decreases in self-criticism um, and improved relationships with self and other which I think is a really important part of what psychedelics offer um, for eating disorders. Um, and around our trial at um, Imperial, we've been doing some public patient involvement work where we've been talking to individuals um, who are in the recovery process from an eating disorder or from anorexia in, in um, particular. Um, and across the board, what they reported in what they would like to see in, in an effective treatment and in, in um, psilocybin assisted therapy is not so much a focus on um, treating the symptoms, but treating um, their sort of relationship with themselves, their relationships with others, and their openness to experience. Um, so again, I think this really highlights um, where um, psilocybin assisted therapy might be effective in this group. Um, so we have a, a uh, published one study where we looked at the uh, possible efficacy of psychedelics in people with eating disorders. And for this work, we spoke to individuals, uh, oh, no, sorry, we didn't speak to, um, I made that up. Um, we, um, this is from survey data that was run online. Um, so these are individuals who uh, had a psychedelic experience of their own accord. Um, and we looked at their uh, depression scores and their well-being before and after that psychedelic experience. And what we found was that people who had reported a lifetime diagnosis of an eating disorder, um, they had decreases in depression symptoms and increases in well-being following that psychedelic experience. Not only that, but um, their uh, improvements in uh, mental health uh, showed a relationship to the uh, emotional breakthroughs that they experienced during that psychedelic experience. So um, there was a, a suggestion of correlation between um, changes in well-being and um, changes in depression and their emotional breakthrough or the cathartic experience that they had. So this again supports the role of the, uh, the acute um, uh, psychedelic experience in the outcomes. So here at Imperial, we're about to start this trial looking at psilocybin as the treatment for anorexia nervosa. Um, so hopefully we'll be starting in the spring. Um, and the primary aim of this study is to assess the feasibility and efficacy of treating anorexia nervosa with psilocybin. So we'll be having um, three uh, psilocybin therapy days um, surrounded by prep and integration and, and all sorts of things. Um, and um, the second aim of the study is to look at the neuronal mechanisms involved in this uh, treatment. So we'll be looking at MRI and EEG as well. So if you'd like to know more about the trial, um, I would invite you to check out um, clinicaltrials.gov for eligibility and updates, um, or you can check out our website for the center. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to thank all of these wonderful humans for all that they do in this space, um, uh, particularly my collaborators on all the work that I've presented today. Um, and I just wanna, wanna also note if you or someone you know is uh, suffering from an eating disorder, please reach out for help. If you're in the UK, the charity Beat is incredible. They do some amazing work and they have some amazing support lines. And I realize I must've been talking really fast because I finished that quite quickly.